All right, we're going to look at what an isotope is, um, some types of isotopes, how that works. And then we're going to do some calculations involving isotopes to arrive at atomic mass. So an isotope, these are essentially the same element. So they're atoms that have the same number of protons, right? Because the number of protons determines what element you're talking about. So these are the same element, same number of protons, but the number of neutrons differ. If that's the case, you look at one version of the element with a certain number of neutrons and another version of the same element with a different number of neutrons, you're comparing isotopes. So for example, here is a picture of a regular hydrogen and the, the red dot there is the proton. We've got an electron on the outside, we're ignoring for now, because um, the isotopes are involving the nucleus, the protons and the neutrons. So regular hydrogen, if you look at the periodic table, it's atomic number is one, and therefore the normal, regular, average hydrogen is gonna weigh one, and if it has a weight of one, it has to have one proton, that's it. That's all that's going on. However, there's another version of hydrogen that actually weighs two. And so if it weighs two, it can't have two protons because then that's helium, right? It has to have one proton because it's hydrogen. So hydrogen has to have one proton. And so if its weight is two and one unit of that weight is a proton, the other unit of that weight has to be a neutron. So we have one proton and one neutron and that's hydrogen because there's one proton but there also is one neutron and so this is another type of hydrogen so there's hydrogen and then there's other type of hydrogen still hydrogen we give it a different name we call it deuterium but it is it is hydrogen it is an isotope of hydrogen and there's another isotope of hydrogen that actually has two protons sorry wait that's not true two neutrons and one proton it has to ha has to have one proton if it's hydrogen. Otherwise, we're not talking hydrogen. And so the weight of this other third type of hydrogen, one proton, two neutrons, it must have a weight of three. If you make some H2O, it's got two hydrogens in it. Um, most H2O is made up of normal hydrogen, which weighs one for each of the hydrogens in in this water molecule. If you make some water out of this heavier version of hydrogen. You can imagine what they'd call it. All right, um, stable isotopes remain unchanged. So there are some isotopes that have a different number of neutrons and they, they just sit there and that's them. But there are some isotopes that because of this different number of neutrons, the nucleus is unstable. So they end up decaying. When they decay, the nucleus breaks apart. It releases radioactivity and hence the name Unstable isotopes are called radioisotopes because they release radiation. Isotopic abundance. So how prevalent, how much there is of each type of isotope, um, we're going to look at getting into the calculations involving that. So let's use carbon as our example. This is what we, we base these atomic masses on anyways. So the mass of elements are relative to carbon 12. So what we did is we said, okay, let's let's take a, a carbon 12 um, and whatever weight it has, we're going to use that to determine the, all the other weights on the periodic table. So this carbon 12, um, we know it has six protons in it and we've got, if it weighs 12, it's got six neutrons as well. Um, so this is a particular isotope of carbon called carbon 12. It has 12 atomic mass units as its mass. So the atomic mass given on the periodic table, you'll notice is for carbon, not 12. It's 12.011, depending on how um, precise your periodic table is, but it is a little bit larger than 12. So if some carbons weigh exactly 12, but the average weight of carbon is 12.01, then that tells you something about the other carbons that are present. Most carbons weigh 12, but a few of them weigh more than that. And therefore the average ends up being a little bit higher than 12. So recall, this is a isotope that is carbon 12. And then there is another type of carbon that actually ends up weighing more called carbon 14. Um, and Obviously, if the average weight of carbon is 12.01-ish, then it tells you a little bit about the abundance of these two isotopes. Since 
the average carbon weighs just over 12, there must be a whole lot of carbon 12. And then it's a little bit higher than 12, so there's a tiny little bit of carbon 14 as well. And when you average out both the, the mass and how much of them have that mass, you end up with the average um, atomic mass. And that's the number you see on the periodic table. So some isotopes um, are more common than others, as we said. Um, and again, this is going to average out to give you the masses you see on the periodic table, the average atomic masses. Um, we get this number by doing a, a weighted average. And you've seen these weighted averages. You're used to them before. Um, if you're taking a class and let, let's say you have a, a quiz that you do and um, I don't know, let's say you get 50% on your quiz. And then later you have an exam and you get 100% on your exam. You would imagine, imagine you didn't do anything else in the class, just one quiz and one exam, you probably would be pretty disappointed if you ended up with a mark of 75%. You, you did get 50% on the quiz and you did get 100% on the exam. Now the average of those two numbers is 75%, but it wouldn't make any sense that your mark should be 75% of the end. And the reason is because we weight these two things differently. The, the connection to, to the, the isotopes that we're looking at is, is the abundance of them. And when we're talking courses and marks, we weight the importance of things differently. So since a quiz only covers a small amount of material, an exam would cover a large amount of material, the weight of the exam mark should be more. That would make sense. And it's the same thing with isotopic abundance. If you have an isotope that you only have a tiny little bit of, and then you have another isotope that you have a whole lot of, the average between them is gonna be closer to the one that you have a whole lot of. And we do that calculation by doing a weighted average. Not only do we count the weight of them, but also the abundance. There's two parts to this calculation. So based on that, we know from carbon 12's average weight of being just over 12, there must be a huge amount of carbon 12 and just a tiny bit of carbon 14. So weighted averages, these account again, for not only the type, which we're gonna see as the, the weight, but also the abundance. The calculation for this, to factor both of those in, if you want to find the average atomic mass, you have to take the different masses, so let's say the mass of A here, um, and then we also have, let's say we were dealing with two isotopes here, we also have the mass of B, but if we just add them together and divide it by two, it would assume that they're equally valuable. It assume their weightings are equal, but that may not be the case. So we have to factor in also the abundance. So what we do is we multiply the mass and the abundance together, and then we add the mass and the abundance of the other one there. Now, with averages, we're used to dividing by the, the denominator, how many there are. So we're gonna factor that in. When we do our abundance calculation, we're gonna do this um, as a percentage converted to a decimal. All right, that's a percentage converted to a decimal. So we're gonna factor in um, the proportion, the abundance of each of the isotopes as we do this calculation. If, for example, we have 75%, so that is making up three quarters of the isotopes. Um, we're gonna express that as a decimal. You could do it as a fraction if you want to, um, but often these are given as percentages, so it's super easy to just convert it into a decimal. It is 0.75 of the whole, and therefore we would uh, factor that in for the abundance, and that's what we'd be multiplying by the mass. So if we wanted to do the opposite, if we wanted to find the abundance, so if we had the average and now we wanted to find the abundance, we would essentially work backwards through this equation. And what we can do is we can use a variable, assuming we know that there are two and only two isotopes, it's gonna be fairly straightforward to do. Otherwise you'd have to know the relationship between the number of variables. But if there's only two, the relationship's super easy to, to uh, imagine. If there are only two isotopes, we know that the two of them have to make up the whole thing. So we can say, okay, well, if there is isotope 
x, which would, whatever weight it has, and isotope y with whatever weight it has, regardless, the two of them together must be the entire amount of atoms that we're talking about. So therefore that makes 100%, or again, we're gonna be working as, as with portions, and so x and y make up the whole thing. So if we wanted to find out, okay, well, that, that's fine. We know x and y, we know isotope x and isotope y make up the only two isotopes. Um, how much would, say, y make up? What portion would y make up? And so what we can say is, well, that if x and y make up all of it, then y would make up all of it minus x's proportion of the whole. And that way, we can express y in terms of x. We can plug this, substitute that into our equation, and then we can use that as the abundance, and we end up in an equation with only one variable. So just to represent this visually, um, if we only have two isotopes, then we know the relationship between them is that the two of them must make up the whole thing. Um, now, if we're going to be calculating for their abundance, we're going to be solving for their abundance, we can't solve for a both x and a y variable. We can't solve an equation with two different variables. But if we know the relationship between those variables, we can set one in terms of the other. We can set y in terms of x. And so we can say, okay, so x and y make up the whole thing. Therefore, y must be the whole thing minus its x value. So we could say that isotope, let's say, isotope A makes up x amount, and isotope B makes up one minus x amount. And that will equal the average weight of the isotope. Then we're able to solve for x. We're able to solve for the abundance of one, and then we can do a little bit of work and find the abundance of the other isotope. So let's try this out. So find the abundance um, of boron 10, and let's say that this specific isotope has a mass of 10.01, and then boron 11 has a mass of 11.01. .01. So realize what we have here. We have boron 10, so think of this as the first isotope. We have its mass. Then we have this second isotope, boron 11, and we have its mass. And we want to find the abundance of both. So the abundance of both we're looking for. Now we're missing something, right? We're missing, well, well what's the average mass of these things? And that's what your periodic table has, right? Most of the information in chemistry is provided on the periodic table. And so we can see that um, boron's average mass is 10.81, depending on what periodic table, you might have a bit more precision. Um, whatever you have, use that in your calculation. So that is the average mass of boron. It's made up of boron 10 and boron 11. And, and again, right away, you can sort of, you, you can ballpark. Anytime you do a calculation, you should try to ballpark the answer in your head first. Um, so if we're looking at finding the abundance of it, and there's one that weighs 10.01, another one that weighs 11.01, .01, and the average works out to be 10.81, you can ballpark who is going to be present in uh, more abundant. Let's set up the equation though. Again, we have our average atomic mass and that's the, the 10.81 atomic mass units. You can put AMU if you want, um, just U for short. And then we, we know that the mass of isotope A, and you could use them interchangeably, A and B, doesn't matter what label you're using, um, but the mass of, of A is 10.01 atomic mass units, and we know that the mass of B is 11.01. .01. Now, if we just divided by two, we'd say that they were equally present. We'd say that the abundance of A and abundance of B are both equal. They're both 50-50. Um, now, that's not the case, and so we can't just add the two masses and divide by two. That's how you get an average but we're doing a weighted average. So we have to also factor in, and, and here we're actually solving for, the abundance of A and the abundance of B. Now, if there are only two isotopes, the two abundances will make up the whole thing. However abundant A is, plus however abundant B is, will make up 100% or one whole. So what we do is we say, okay, I don't know what the abundance of A is, but we're gonna put in, whoop, let's use the right color here, we're gonna put in X 
as a variable that is the abundance of A. And B is different. It has a different abundance, probably. Um, and we know based on the, the average, it must be different. Um, but the abundance of B is some other variable. And we can't solve an equation with two variables, but we do know the relationship between these two variables. And that is, again, X and Y, the abundance of uh, isotope A and the abundance of isotope B equals the whole thing. So we can put Y in terms of X, y is equal to 1 minus x and then we can substitute that in for y and now we have an equation with a single variable and we know how to solve equations with single variables so multiply your brackets and then put the terms x on one side and solve for what x is equal to Let's see if you can get it done before i can you end up with x equaling 0.2 so that makes 0.2 of the whole another way of saying that would be 20%. So the abundance, remember we, we said that X is the abundance of A and A is boron 10. So boron 10 makes up 20% of the abundance of this isotope. Now realize we didn't solve for Y, but we can do that part in our head. If X is 20%, if, if isotope A boron 10 weighs 20%, then boron 11 must make up the remainder 80%. So boron 10 is 20%. And the remainder, boron 11, makes up 80%. Which, when we ballparked in our head, based on the average, there should be more boron 11 than boron 10. Checks out, and everyone's happy.